an earthquake in January and improvements in Haiti. Um, and so on your left, this is the map of Port au Prince uh, for the earthquake. And this is one from a couple weeks afterwards. Um, so as you can see, there's a little bit of information available, but not much. Uh, Tim Waters had imported some available data, but there was no mapping community to do that. Um, so after the earthquake, what happened was people just started mapping. They didn't really talk to each other. Um, a couple hours afterwards, uh, someone in Germany and then someone in Japan and then someone in Germany just started mapping. And then people started talking to each other. So um, then we started getting reports like this. Um, so this is the GPS, um, a search and rescue team looking for people. Um, in downtown Port of France. So people started actually using the data. And we were seeing pictures from the World Bank and the World Health Organization using OpenStreetMap. And um, so the thought was, what happens after that? So no one was mapping before, and all of a sudden people started mapping like crazy. Um, but it wasn't really anyone who lived in Haiti or even had a particular attachment to the country other than a desire to help. Uh, so we started traveling there. Um, the first um, trip happened around uh, March of 2010, and the earthquake was in January. And then we went there um, about six times that year. And the idea was, can we teach people living and working in Haiti how to update the map? Um, this picture is actually a couple years later. This is in Saint Marc, which is actually not the earthquake type area. And uh, so we worked together to map that commune with um, the uh, Overstreet on Haiti group. So the, and this is a funded project through USA. Um, so a lot of the work there has been in specific areas working with donors, but also a community that's doing volunteer mapping has occurred as well. Um, one of the big uh, aspects of our trip were these Pelican pieces. So these are big uh, plastic waterproof boxes. So uh, one of the questions was, how do you get people to map um, or help them map if they don't have any equipment, no computers, GPS? Um, so we started bringing sort of open street map in a box as well. Um, I've heard that there's some GPS lending that goes around on here in the Philippines, and I think that's really important. Um, and as equipment gets cheaper, maybe it'll be even easier to be able to do that. So after this, the question came about, what if we did things for preparedness? Uh, and you're actually going to hear a lot about Indonesia this weekend, um, more than you would think it did about the Philippines. Uh, three of my colleagues from uh, hot Indonesia are here. You guys wait. Uh, and we'll be talking about a couple of our uh, projects there. We were fortunate that we were, um, um, we've been working with the World Bank and the idea is how can we build stronger open street map communities in East Asia. So this is one of those steps is allowing people to meet each other um, and see how things are working somewhat the same, what, what we can learn and that sort of thing. So anyway, the idea of this was what if we mapped ahead of time? Instead of what we unfortunately typically do is wait for a disaster and all of a sudden, that area of the world is really well mapped. Um, and so the Australia-Indonesia Facility for Disaster Reduction and the World Bank were building open source software that took um, two types of information. A hazard model, which would be like an earthquake or a tsunami, and exposure information. Exposure information is like population information, infrastructure like schools, um, government buildings. And if you combine the two, you can get the impact of what a disaster would be. So in a specific type of flood, how many schools would be closed? So the problem was they didn't have any of that exposure data. They had hazard models for earthquakes and tsunamis, but nothing to combine them with to get that answer. So could we use community mapping through OpenStreetMap to, uh, to uh, collect this exposure information? and then allow disaster managers to better plan. Uh, so I'm going to give a couple examples of some mapping we did. Um, and then there's going to be some more specifics later in the day. Um, so one of our, the first 
first things we did was we just went and looked for people that were already doing that. Not with OpenStreetMap, just some of them sort of mapping. Very similar to the shot of the community-based mapping that we by uh, ESSC 20 years ago. We found groups doing that in Indonesia as well. Um, communities getting together with paper maps, uh, mapping things like village resources, um, all of the households having discussions about what it means to be rich, what it means to be poor. Um, are your schools only in the rich areas? Um, are there no facilities in the poor areas? And so um, the idea for us was that if we map everything once, everyone could use it. So um, creating poverty maps that these um, groups were creating is a noble, noble purpose, but not really related to what we're doing. But if we map all the buildings, we can map once and use it many times, which we often see in the street map. Not um, so this is one of the second generation community maps um, that uh, they were working with. So a lot of groups had moved from doing paper maps to using Corel Draw to make maps. So this map is more like a piece of art than a map. So it has no concept of latitude and longitude. You couldn't overlay it um, on another map and compare it. The other thing is, there's no data behind it. So each of these colors relate to each house and how um, and the green ones are people that are rich, the yellow are people that are middle income, and the red ones are people that are poor. But the thing is, the village themselves determined what that means. What if in the discussion you change your mind? And you, then someone needs to go through and recolor every single house. Um, in the days before that, uh, before this, I saw maps where they use little uh, buttons and sequins. You'd be pulling all of the glue off and then gluing your map back together. So what we started showing them was that we could use OpenStreetMap to do this. And then you could have things be data driven. Um, this is one of the first villages we mapped, uh, which um, we did two. We did one with satellite imagery and one with GPS. And the reason is we wanted to show that both would work. Um, what's interesting is what has happened without us. Um, so the local NGOs we were working with have been active in those areas a long time. Um, and they actually uh, started talking to the government about it, universities and private companies. And there was actually an agreement Find that the goal was to make West Nusa Tenggara the best map province in Indonesia. And they're not finished mapping yet, but there's many, many districts that have been mapped in huge areas. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've also done in Jakarta. Uh, or actually, I'm not, because uh, you'll hear a bit about it uh, later. Um, so I'm going to talk about something we've done in East Java as well. So this is fast forwarding um, a couple of years to this year. Uh, because after the initial mapping, it was determined, yes, you can open, use OpenStreetMap. Yes, people will map. Um, but then the question was, how can we use help disaster managers? Um, so we began a pro program called Scenario Development for Contingency Planning. And the idea is to use InnoSafe, the open source impact modeling software as we and OpenStreetMap together um, to create, contingent, uh, create disaster scenarios, which being contingent into contingency plan. So you go through the process of saying, OK, this is our type of disaster. This is what happened. And then, um, OK, let's plan for it. How much food do we need? Where are safe evacuation places? All those questions you would ask to prepare for a disaster. Um, and so this is one of the examples. Um, so Hot Indonesia started providing assistance in these contingency planning processes. We had done a lot of training, but people weren't really comfortable taking the technology and using it themselves yet. So um, this is in East Java. Uh, it's a pretty uh, big area. Uh, this, is the long, this is the longest river on Java, and it floods a lot. Um, it's across five districts. And the last time it flooded was this year in April. So um, one of the key things with all this mapping, having a 
lot of them out there. Um, this is our first time working with the scouts. So, um, uh, so along with um, having university students and the Indonesian Red Cross help, also the scouts were very involved in doing the actual mountain. Um, and here's some uh, pictures from that. As you can see, there was a lot of different things involved. Um, these are all uh, field papers that were made for the project. Um, the, there was actually an uh, IT person there who created his own version of field papers, a local version, because the printing and downloading demands were too much on the internet. Um, but you can see there's lots of different um, people involved in this process. Um, and just a quick reminder for those who might not know what uh, field papers are, here's an example of one. So you print the OpenStreetMap data, and then you can draw on it, take a picture with your phone, and upload it, and use it as a basis in the editor. Um, so this is what was heavily used for the collection. Um, in addition to these technical projects, uh, we also created a bunch of materials. So um, you may have even seen this flyer before. Um, here it is in Indonesian, but it's been since translated into at least French and English. Um, so we made this just so we had something to hand people to explain what the street map is. Um, the biggest thing was having local materials. Um, the rate of people that, so my experience in the Philippines is only in Manila, but the rate that people speak English is less in Jakarta, for example. So, and, and if you go to rural areas, then it has to be in Manila. Um, so part of it was making sure that there was information available that people could read. The second part of it was um, having training materials. So. Um, some of you may be familiar with learnosm.org. Um, that came out of this project. So it was first released in English and Indonesian, and I believe it's in nine languages today. Um, and what it was, was there's a lot of information in the OpenStreetMap wiki, but the problem is it's not definitive information. If you're a beginner, you don't want to know that there's spy voices or something. You just want someone to tell you to do it wrong. The simplest. So that was what this is meant to do. Um, and this information, um, and so this is a curriculum with a guide that an instructor can take and say, OK, I'm going to write a class on OpenStreetMap. What do I need to do? Um, the end goal, or, or one of the main goals of this, is to submit this to the Indonesian Disaster Management Agency um, and get it approved as part of their official training. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about another project that we've done. Um, the person who helped us with this, or actually did a lot of the work in this project, from the American Red Cross, uh, Robert Bannock, says he's probably going to come tomorrow. Um, so he's been here helping uh, with the typhoon response and happens to be in Manila for a couple days. Um, so this is a fire risk map in Hulu in uh, Uganda. And this was made based on OpenStreetMap data. And what happened was the OpenStreetMap international community was asked to trace information, roads and buildings. And then Robert went and worked with the Ugandan Red Cross to actually fill in the details you can only see from the ground. And so this fire risk map, I'm going to show you what these, the huts look like. And so you can see that these would burn very easily. So having that information mapped and be able to do analysis is very important. Um, so we actually um, have worked in quite a few places. One of the questions that happens sometimes is, well, what country is this cost going to work in? Um, so when uh, Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of the United States, um, we helped with open geographic data, but not actually with open street maps. Uh, so this application here is called MapMill, and myself and Skylar Girl had built a sample uh, prototype uh, using a historic imagery taken from aircraft um, of uh, damage. What is normally used is the public laboratory 
um, for open science does a lot of balloon and kite mapping. So they end up with a whole lot of pictures, but we need to sort which ones are good or bad. So it was designed to sort if a picture was good or bad. So we just changed it to say, okay, not okay, or bad, and ask people for damage. <coughs> So in the U.S., the Civil Air Patrol is, has over 500 um, aircraft. It's a uh, small aircraft. It's the auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force. And so when there's a disaster in the United States, they fly and take pictures. So after um, Hurricane Sandy, they took a whole bunch of pictures. And over 6,000 people helped sort those pictures, which helped then drive on-the-ground assessment of where people what has happened before is they would take thousands of pictures, put them on a DVD, hand them to someone in the emergency operations center, but who knew, knows if anyone knows it? So uh, crowdsourcing was able to help uh, figure out where to look. Um, another thing we did um, around State of the Map uh, Japan was we were really lucky to be invited by Open have to hand to go to some of the tsunami affected areas and see how they were ma mapping the recovery um, and see you know how, how the data was from when the whole international community had mapped it and how it was going to be updated in the future. So we've been doing a lot of different things. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about um, how OpenStreetMap Philippines and uh, Hot have been mapping here recently in light of the recent typhoon. Um, what, was, what was interesting, um, because versus a tsunami or earthquake, you can see it coming a couple days in advance. So people started mapping about two days ahead of time. Um, and 33 people mapped over 10,000 buildings. Who in this room has helped do some of this mapping? <laughs> Um, which is coordinated to the hot tasking manager. Uh, there's still plenty of work to do. So if anyone hasn't mapped and would like to help, there's still jobs on the um, tasking manager for people to take. And how the tasking manager works is you get a specific um, thing to do, and then it tells you the what and why, and if you were to click on the workflow, that's the what. And then the task, you can click a button, and then you can assign one of these little squares. And so then you go map everything in that square. Here's another, um, here's the example after someone clicked on it. And you see you can pick your favorite editor, and then go do editing for that square. And when you're done, you write a comment, mark it as done, and um, then it goes, gets the color changes on it. So the current count is over 6,000 people, 1,600 people have contributed. What I think is interesting is after the earthquake in Haiti um, three and a half years ago, after the first month, only 600 people had contributed. And I think there's a couple, I think there's three reasons. One, OpenStreetMap is better known. The response community knows it's there and uses it. So that's sort of an incentive that we know we're doing something good. Two, the tasking manager did not exist then. So the problem was, you just tell people, go map somewhere blank. If you're a new person, that's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and third, for new people, the new ID editor is easy for someone to get started. So really, a big thing is that the tools have been so for the last little bit, I'm just going to talk about how you can get involved. And this could be currently now in the typhoon response, helping people elsewhere in the world, um, building tools. There's many ways, if you're interested, to work with POT. Um, and one thing that, that I think is interesting to think about it is this global community has started helping each other. So if there's a crisis somewhere, a lot of people from other countries go over and help with the map for a while. There's been mapping parties for the Philippines in Haiti, Nepal, Spain, um, United Kingdom, Japan. Um, 
And then individual work from all over. And I've definitely missed some of the other mapping parties. Actually, there was one in Northern Ireland two days ago. Um, it's so much help is going on, it's difficult to even keep track. Um, so, let's talk about getting involved. Um, one of the broader ways to get involved um, that maybe some of you are already involved this way is the Digital Humanitarian Network. So HOT is a member of the Digital Humanitarian Network. And what that is, is it's a bunch of individual volunteer groups um, working together. Um, so the idea is if a response agency has a problem and we, can solve it, we think we can solve it, they can request it to help from us. But maybe HOT's not the only answer. Maybe um, Map Action can help. Or maybe the Standby Task Force or statistics, statisticians without borders. Um, so there's this more, even larger global community related to disaster response. Um, and HOT's actually one of the coordinators for this now. And by HOT, I mean myself. Um, because, uh, so there's a core, core set of coordinators of four people that we sort of make sure that if a request comes in, that it's understood in the community. Uh, another way to get involved is the Learn OSM website I was talking about. Um, if, uh, so it's in a bunch of languages. It could always be translated. Um, sections can always be updated um, and improved. There's a, you can just test out the materials. There's a lot of different things to do. For example, um, right now we're in the process of updating um, the QGIS guide part of it, which Quantum GIS has been updated to version 2.0, and the interface is significantly changed. Um, we have other tools people can help with. Um, if you're a developer, there's the hot export tool. And what this does is it allows you to download a specific OpenStreetMap area, and you can specify which data you want. You can make a translation lookup table. So one of the big issues that we ran into is that OpenStreetMap data is in English. And there's ways to mask that so the editors can be translated. So you can enter the data in whatever language you're most comfortable with. But then when you download it, it's still in English. So it's actually kind of confusing. Uh, so this allows you, you can create, create a dictionary and then download it in a different language. Um, and anyway, there's plenty of features that can be added to this tool. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, there's plenty of uh, tools for mappers, plenty of tasks for mappers. You can always map on a testing manager. Um, and if you're a developer and you know Python, you can help contribute to it as well. Uh, we're currently in an alpha version of the second um, edition of the testing manager. It's designed to work better on older computers with slow internet, um, and also uh, writing the tasks in multiple languages is intended to be easier. Uh, but it's not quite ready for prime time yet. And then everyone loves meetings, right? Um, every other Monday, we have an IRC meeting um, at 5 p.m. GMT, which unfortunately is late. Here. Um, I live in Jakarta and I have a hard time meeting, making this because um, it's midnight for me. Um, but also, if there's interest in being involved in some of the more technical aspects of HOT, let me know because we've been discussing having more than one meeting because it's impossible to coordinate between North America, Europe, and Asia and not have someone waking up really early or staying up. So, I sort of just wanted to give an um, outline of what we've been doing and how people can help um, and uh, how you can join the gang. Uh, this is Joseph. Uh, he's actually one of our board members. Uh, he's somewhere in Indonesia. I think. I don't know where. But anyway, uh, he came and helped uh, with our workshops uh, about a year ago. Um, so there are possibilities even to travel to other places and help other communities get started. Um, I think I have a couple minutes left. If anyone has any questions, I'm looking at our moderator. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I just want to know if uh, what would be the triggers for the activation of hack. For example, if uh, there happens to be a disaster, uh, how can the community or even probably a government agency trigger? participation. So our major requirement is that the map data will be useful. Um, so the easiest thing to do would be request mapping uh, on the, the hot mailing list, which is at hot at openstreetmap.org. Um, one of the things that we're um, going to be working on shortly with the Indonesian government is working up a a standard operating procedure because what does sort of tend to happen is someone just calls the person they know, which kind of works, but it's a busy or for whatever reason. Um, it's not really effective. Uh, we do have an activation working group as well. Um, their meetings aren't as regular as the um, technical working group. I know they'll be doing a sort of a hot wash um, discussion regarding the most recent activation to figure out how it can be smoother. Um, but one thing that's happened, especially in the Philippines, is um, we've focused around Philippines and have worked very closely together for now years. Um, unfortunately, the cyclical activities happened, and then there's it's somewhere to map. Um, so yeah, that is the easiest, easiest way, but we're trying to make it a little more transparent. The other way is you can actually activate hot for the digital humanitarian effort as well, which is at uh, digitalhumanitarians.com. It has the four people out. Um, ironically, I would probably then respond, but or one of the other four. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's specific to Manila. Obviously, urban areas are very different. Um, like in Kathmandu, there's an effort to map every building with all of the uh, with the basic infrastructure information to make an to make an earthquake impact the map, for example. And it's very, very dense. So one of the issues they run into is just simple getting the buildings on the map that are so close to each other. Um, I think for fire, uh, in some places the issue could just be having up to date street information to get from point A to point B. Um, and then with traffic, um, I think you would probably combine the open street map data with maybe real time data from a source, but you could probably collect it. Um, I think that there are companies working on that. I want to say, I want to say the name is Polanap, but I might be wrong on that. Yeah, I think there's probably a couple, but um, having that base data there means at least you can do
work that happens in Indonesia, we have a full-time team. Um, a lot of, most of the people here are completely volunteered. Um, so how does that work for people's availability? Uh, what are people interested in doing? Um, and, and also, what can response organizations do in return as well? Um, so hopefully some people will be joining us tomorrow for that. Uh, and I'm also, I'm spending an extra couple days here um, to meet with a couple people about that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, when we have a short break, let's go on outside. Wala ayaw, and then we come back for the session. Oh, hi. How are you?